Random fun crystal fact. Do you guys see this little, it's not really a scar. Crystal used to be a little punk rock chick and at one point she had her lip pierced right there. It was cute for like a minute and then one day I woke up and I was like, what are you doing with your life? Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to my channel. Everyone has been dying for me to review the last few episodes of basically the mid-season finale that Ghost Adventures had. So I have about five or six episodes that I need to catch up on reviews. So we're gonna do two of the biggest requested right now. So let's start with the Titanic episode. So in this episode, Ghost Adventures heads to Bronson, Missouri. They are going to check out this fancy, somewhat new museum that was built and opened in 2006. I found it very interesting that they actually took the blueprints from the real Titanic and replicated it 50% smaller. Now it's actually fairly known that this museum is haunted from actual artifacts that have been delivered to this location from survivors and even from debris that was floating in the sea when the ship sunk. So out of curiosity, I did get on the website for, it's called titanicbranson.com. I wanted to get on the website and basically see if they did ghost hunts because a location like this would probably benefit from having you know, maybe monthly investigations, possibly weekly. So on the website, there's nothing about, you know, actually ghost hunts. So it appears that in order to get in there, you know, you have to have pretty elite recognition, which is obviously why Ghost Adventures got in. You pre-order tickets and adults are $22.90 plus tax. Children from 5 to 12 are $11.57 uh, and then there's an actual family pass that's $71.21. Children 0 to 4 are free, but there are no, you know, investigations that take place here, although they do promote field trips and things like that, I'm assuming for local schools. The facts of the Titanic are so sad, like if you really rip apart the history behind it, it shipped sail for April 10th. They were going from England to New York. Four days into it on April 14th, they hit the iceberg and the Titanic went down. The statistics, 2,208 people on board, 1,496 deaths. 50% of the children on board did not make it. The first thing that obviously I thought was amazing was the replication of the grand staircase the staircase is something everyone spoke about when it was, you know, still afloat. It was the most beautiful piece of architecture on the ship. It was neat to see that the staircase could actually be replicated. The first apparition they discuss with one of the innkeepers at the museum is John Jacob Astor. They didn't really talk about his history very much. He was an American businessman, he was in real estate, he was an investor, he was a writer, and he also served in the Spanish-American War. He was 47 when he died, and he was survived by his 18-year-old wife, who was pregnant just a few months along, and she did survive the Titanic. He liked him young, mm -hmm. Something interesting behind him is that he actually went to Harvard and he is buried at a cemetery in New York. His story is kind of sad. He married a girl named Madeline Force, who was 18, and he was kind of made fun of within his community because there was such a large age difference between him and his new bride. The couple was kind of tired of being ridiculed within their community, so they took a trip in Europe and Egypt and was hoping when they came home 
all the chatter within the community would kind of calm down and they could go about their life and live on. Sadly, he would never make it home. But he had a friend that accompanied them on this trip to Europe and Egypt. And her name was Molly Brown. She also was a survivor of the Titanic. She was also known as the unsinkable Molly Brown. Now the weird connection that I have with this is I actually know the family. They're not the Browns, not Margaret Brown's family. But there is a family that owns her previous homes in Colorado. I've gotten to go in both of those homes. They're, they were considered her summer homes. She has two, one is located in downtown Denver, which is known as the Molly Brown Tea House, and the other home is located on the west side of town, which is where I grew up, and it's on the border of Littleton and Lakewood. If you're not familiar with who Molly Brown was, she was more of a philanthropist, and she was known as being a, a very elite, wealthy socialite in the early 1900s. The story behind Molly Brown along with John Jacob Astor was they had traveled France and Europe and Egypt together in the very beginning parts of 1912 and Molly Brown had received word from her family that one of her grandchildren was seriously ill in Denver. The fastest way that she could get home at that time was booking a trip back to England and to board the Titanic back for New York. Her eldest daughter had also been traveling with her at the time when they were in Egypt and France. She was supposed to go with Molly Brown back to Denver, but ended up staying to study in France. That is when you see those really strange lines that cross paths in your life. It's like maybe she wasn't meant to get on that boat so that she survived, it's very strange when you look at things, you know, like this case. I love to step back and say, sometimes things don't work for the best and you may not realize it until later. And this is obviously visual proof for Molly Brown and her daughter. So Molly Brown did survive. She was in Lifeboat 6. I just found it was very interesting that she had a connection to John Jacob Astor, who was featured in the beginning part of the Ghost Adventures uh, episode. As a side note, if anyone does stay in Colorado or goes to visit Colorado, try to go either book the tea event at the Molly Brown House downtown Denver or try to go see her summer home, which is on the west side of town. That is the home that I got to experience frequently. The family that owns it has had it for many years, but they do believe that Molly Brown's spirit does come in that home often. Any time that I got to go inside of that home, it was very peaceful and honestly, it was quite enjoyable, which I've heard Molly Brown had a very happy, um, you know, vivacious sort of life that she liked to express and share with anyone that was around her. The home originally, they had turned it into kind of like a resale store, um, more like a vintage shop where they would take in furniture and jewelry and clothing and resell it. Eventually, they did turn it into um, basically like an event center. So I believe you can actually get married at the unsinkable Molly Brown's house that's in Lakewood, um, Littleton area. I remember being a child and experiencing that home because they're family friends of ours. And I didn't realize who Molly Brown was. I didn't realize the extent of it. I know, you know, they would educate me on the Titanic, so I knew about it from a very young age. I understood that, you know, Molly Brown made it on Lifeboat 6. I understood all of that stuff, but I didn't realize the extent of the history that, you know, Molly Brown progressed for the state of Colorado. She was very involved as a philanthropist in Colorado. So I just found it as a very interesting key. So if you ever get to visit either of those homes in Colorado, I really suggest you go because it's like an eternal piece of history that you know she's kind of imprinted in that state. They go on to say that John Jacob Astor was the richest man on the Titanic and even money cannot purchase your life. His wife was pregnant, she was 18, the women and children were put on lifeboats first. His wife did make it off and make it home alive, but he never made it. Even money cannot buy you a ticket to completing your journey on this earth. So I just thought that was a really strong message that I kind of wanted to reiterate, like really think about that. That's like one of those in-depth 
um, thoughts that I love. They believe John Jacob is haunting the ship because they have rebuilt his bedroom or suite that was actually on the Titanic. A lot of people get emotional and cry, so that tells you people that might be sensitive, maybe empaths, maybe just regular people go in and actually feel a sensation of all of that residual energy from people dying on the ship that night. I really thought the musician room was awesome, the eight musicians that passed away. And suddenly the episode shift gears into the innkeepers believing there's a lot of children and children energy running up and down the hallways and they claim that there was um, basically a handprint on one of the windows inside of the hallway which Zach captures on camera to show us. I have to sound a little bit skeptical and just say that because I didn't see any b-roll footage of you know the innkeepers actually cleaning the windows down we can't indefinitely say that that was an apparition's handprint i'm not saying it's impossible i'm just not saying it's a hundred percent possible either but it was such a sad statement when they said 130 children were on board and half lost their lives that night so zach thinks he feels this energy he immediately turns on the psb7 and this is just during the walkthrough and nothing comes up on the PSB7. Once again, so I talked about this before, I'm not sure how many ghost hunters they've actually had inside of this replica Titanic, but when you're working with apparitions that may not be familiar with ghost gear, you really should verbalize trying to get them to use it. Try to teach them, you know, don't be afraid to come up to me, don't be afraid to come up to this item. What you do is you speak into it or put your energy into this and we will be able to hear you and communicate with you. And when Zach turned on the PSV7, I didn't hear him say that. I think he was really excited and nervous to be maybe communicating with the child spirit, but that could definitely be why there wasn't any evidence produced from the PSV7, especially when you're working with children energies. Children have the hardest time because they've been trained to not trust adults, right? Don't talk to strangers. So if you're open with them on how to communicate with ghost gear, you're gonna get better results. This is when Zach goes on to the captain's bridge and this is where we see the handprints that are on this window area and the innkeepers claim that they cleaned the windows before they came in and they had like a dual check to make sure that it was clean before they came in to film. I'm just a skeptic on it, I have to be honest, and that's because indefinitely how sure are we that these got cleaned. You just don't know, especially if the museum had been open all day for, for people, just regular people coming through on a tour. I was just a little skeptical on it, that's all. I, I can't, I just have to be honest with you guys. The next kind of visual we had as an audience was these wall murals showing the names of the third class, second class, and first class passengers that didn't make it home. It was really sad to see that a majority of the deaths from the ship were third class people. The number was 181 survived and 528 people from third class passed away. So we've heard facts based on this, which is they tried to get the first and second class passengers out first. They didn't let as many third class passengers get on the lifeboats. They had the only Bible that survived the sinking of the Titanic, which was from that reverend or minister. He said that when they put it on the actual pedestal and let it fall naturally, that the very first entry that it opened to was Christ walking on water. They have the life jacket they actually cut from a body that had been in the ocean for a few days which is really really horrific and sad and I thought it was really cool that they have the exhibits like you can touch your hand in the 28 degree water and note that 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing which means the ocean was 28 degrees that's four degrees further than freezing which is so sad. So that tells you that people probably fell asleep quickly, went into hypothermia, and passed away while they were in the water. From here they went to this toy museum, which I found really strange. Zach was trying to negotiate with the woman that was working, I'm not sure if she was the owner, and obviously she has some really old things that are not able to be replicated, and he's trying to negotiate with her to purchase some of the items in the museum of toys. 
I loved though that like she bit back at Zach because he said something like, uh, you know, I don't really want new toys. And then she said, well, if it looks old, a spirit may not know the difference. <laughs> They're trying to negotiate renting toys, nothing works. And all of a sudden the train wrecked. And when I saw that, the very first thing I thought of was the scene in Casper. Do you guys remember that? When like he wrecks the trains. So I just thought it was kind of oddly iconic. So finally, the investigation starts with the Titanic. And I have to say, I feel thoroughly disappointed in the evidence that they captured. So Billy sits down, he's in the area where the musicians have been kind of eternalized, and he says, I'm going to call out the musicians by name and see if we can communicate with them through any of the ITC devices that we have. Zach's in the hallway with Jay, they show them kind of this fast image of them cleaning the windows, and there's childlike handprints again on the walls. They're using the SLS, um, they get a couple of figures once they're standing on the window seal, and another one is like down further at another window. I did like the SLS footage because when they got the second image of the child or the shorter apparition, it looked as if its arms were standing out on the window seal like it was trying to balance. So I found that interesting. That would be intelligent activity, not residual. If there was an actual apparition thinking they had to balance themselves, that would be what they would be doing. They're replicating if they had the physical body here still on the physical plane. There was a sentence that Zach said at this point. He is calling to Aaron and Billy, letting them know that they're getting this incredible footage. And he says, quote, I baited them to the window with the toys and candy. Let me just give you guys a little bit of advice. Ghost hunting sounds strange. I know that we are technically hunting using cameras and thermocams and imaging cameras and equipment to communicate because it's not something we can always see with our natural eyes. But if you treat energies like you are entering their house, not baiting them, like if you were, you know, deer hunting or something like that. But if you actually communicate with them like they are real people and they're still here, you will get such better evidence. You will be blown away when you decide to transfer into their realm and really thoroughly become a passenger of the Titanic. I feel like this point in the show, you know, we're already in the investigation. They've gotten really fixated on the kid spirits, which I'm not saying is impossible. I just wish we would have seen a little bit more fluidity, you know, even trying to talk to the apparition John Jacob. I felt like they could have used the environment as a tool more than they did throughout the investigations. And by that, I mean if they would have used and gotten a little bit more knowledgeable behind the passengers and the history of the Titanic, that could have been used as trigger objects or trigger items, right? If they're talking about certain passengers that passed away, even if it's the captains or if it's possibly even the musical men that were actually on the ship, maybe even some of the child's names. When you've been on a cruise or a ship for four days, you tend to slowly get to know everyone or someone knows someone else. And that could have been a real key trigger to interact with these children or John Jacob or if any of the other apparitions are there as well. During the SLS footage, you know, Zach says, we did, you know, clean the windows off again and now we have more footage of there's fingerprints on this same particular window and I just wasn't completely sold on the fingerprints. That's just me. I don't know what it would have taken to see the fingerprints if it would have been like a fast motion of seeing one of the innkeepers go from window to window or like, you know, fast forward it over like a 10 second time so that we're like, okay, yep, they went on the inside and the outside. I don't know what it would have taken for me to believe that. I just have a really hard time. I have a hard time believing that because I've, I've done experiments where there have been fingerprints with glass or when you're doing those, you know, hometown investigations where a car will move up or down a hill because children died in a bus or something and they push the car. I've done all those experiments and I've never had 
physical fingerprints show up because that's a human thing, you know? Like, we have our physical bodies here. How can an apparition leave an actual print mark which is made up of oils and human skin when they don't have that? So I'm just very skeptical when it comes to getting and gathering fingerprints as evidence when we're talking about apparitions. I felt like the investigation started to pick up when Aaron and Billy were sitting on the floor. They obviously had like Oreos and candy and the ovulus goes off saying female and it's like a six-year-old child. The ovulus also says eat. I like when you get accurate interaction on top of it every single time you're asking a question, you're getting intelligent communication. So I think that scene I appreciated more than the entire episode because it means that they're actually interacting with something that's intelligent, that's on a different plane. It said deep and I wasn't really sure about that because Aaron started kind of going off about water or something like that. And then it said descend. And that was like, wow, that's the confirmation that we're definitely talking about the ship sinking into the ocean or the people sinking and descending into the water. I also liked that they used the ITC device during the same time that they had the ovulus on and the ovulus says how, and it almost sounded like a female voice came through and it, they said it was like a moan, but to me it almost sounded like how, you know, kind of like that. Later on, Zach goes into another area of the museum and he's hearing like a vibration, which we hear it definitely, which is this big piece of glass that has iceberg right ahead uh, scribed into it, which is exactly what the captain said before they hit the iceberg. Frederick Fleet, and that room also had Frederick Fleet and his quotes. Zach says he sees a glowing child, which leads him into the children's room. They think they get a child that says, peekaboo on the PSB7, that's in front of the life jacket. And then this was another issue I had. Zach went to try to communicate with the child apparition and he said, little child, question mark. So he's addressing him as a little child. If you transcend into the location that you're at and you really merge with it and become one, the success that you have with communicating is endless. And you also have to put yourself in those apparitions shoes, whoever it is or wherever they're from. If he thinks he's interacting with a child, you kind of have to get down to their plane. And once again, as a child, you've been taught not to go up to strangers, so you're going to be nervous and hesitant because it's everything against your parents have taught you. Another thing is, can you remember being a kid, even at eight or nine, even 10, and when people called you, oh, you're a little child, you're just a child, like, do you remember how angry that would make you as a kid? So I was like, Zach isn't thinking about what that child is going to, how he's going to respond to him. A kid is gonna probably get offended. Don't call me a little child, I'm a big kid, you know? Just try to really think, if you compare the communication that you have going on as you're ghost hunting, like that child isn't an apparition, it is an actual child standing in front of you, your communication will go so much better and they will be willing to open up to you when you don't treat them like they're dead. And I know that sounds crazy, but I have done so much investigating, guys. If you treat them like you are there meeting them on that level, on that plane of existence, that apparition will be like, this person gets me. Billy saw a child He's off by himself. Aaron says, wait a minute. The ITC device goes off that Bill Chapel made and it says kid. I loved the statement that Billy said. And what he said was, there are children in here. They are running around. He said that very infinitely. He had no hesitation in his voice. And I appreciate that statement because we've all felt that before, right? There's sometimes I'll go into a location, I'll immediately say, there's a female here. How I know, I don't know. I just feel that energy. Once you've interacted with the other side enough, you can tell, is it a child spirit? Is it something really dark? Is it a female? Is it a male? And so I just really appreciated Billy saying, there is a child here. 
and they are running around. I love that statement just because he was so sure of himself he was not questioning himself and he was just going with it. Sometimes our intuition is stronger, more predominant and trustworthy than any piece of ghost gear can be in our life while we're using it during an investigation. So now at the end, the very last thing that we see is Billy has the thermocam. He's going in through certain areas of the museum and Aaron walks up to the life jacket and they think they see some sort of a very light blue in color on the thermocam apparition standing kind of catty corner from Aaron. I had an issue with this piece of evidence and that is because they are using a thermocam inside of an area that has a lot of glass. I've talked about my episode of Paranormal Challenge before and unfortunately the other team used their thermocam around glass and mirrors and you can't tell the difference when you're staring into a thermocam. You cannot tell if it's glass or not, but whatever's reflecting that heat signature is going to make you assume that it's an actual apparition in that heat signature. It could have been an apparition that Billy captured on the thermocam, but I would not have chose that piece of ghost gear in a room full of reflective surfaces, meaning maybe shiny countertops, there was obviously glass cases in there, and even possibly mirrors. So personally, for me, I have to label that last piece of evidence as possible matrixing. Also, the apparition color on the thermocam was like a very dark blue, very hints of light blue and that made me concerned that it was still, once again, possibly a reflection of Aaron standing near or by glass. I was kind of sad about this episode, honestly. I just really felt like not many people have the opportunity to have an entire night or week, however long it took them to investigate on the Titanic um, mini size inside of the museum. And since they had full access, I just felt like there was a lot of missed opportunities considering the raw history that we all know behind the Titanic. I didn't hear them talk about anything other than what was presented to them from the innkeepers on the actual ship and the endless amounts of historical facts connected to the Titanic could have really benefited them during the investigation as, I don't wanna say provocation, but you could, you could have used probably some of it for provocation for you know factual purposes. While this episode was being aired, Chip Coffey, who is a big psychic known in the community, did state that he went in and experienced children apparitions. He actually posted that before they started speaking about the children on the ship. So I found that very compelling. So if there's other people in the community that have experienced haunts in that location, especially people that are reputable, I don't doubt that the ship is haunted. I assume that it could be very haunted. I have come to find out that children apparitions tend to be the most lost when it comes to crossing over. So it wouldn't shock me that there is an abundance of children apparitions running around on the ship. I just wish that they would have pushed the bar further with not only the investigation, but the actual process of using historical facts to benefit them. Just keep that in mind when you guys investigate. What did you guys think about the Titanic episode with Ghost Adventures? You know I love to hear from you below. Make sure you guys follow me on social media. Make sure you guys subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys give me a thumbs up and I will catch you guys next time. I'm